There is a grave danger in not understanding the position of those you disagree with. This is especially true in 2020. So we are up to our final letter. Z is for zebra in the ABCs of modified theology. I was taught to refute evolution. It was a cornerstone of evangelical apologetics that we had to go after, Darwinian evolution. Zebras and their stripes were a primary example that we used to refute evolution. See, if the stripes on a zebra and herd of zebras is to camouflage the herd against predators, then the thinking is that the first zebra to have stripes, that offspring, would actually have stood out and been more visible from the herd and thus would have been an easy target. This is an example of getting ahead of oneself and not fully understanding or entering into the school of thought that one's trying to combat. You see this in funny videos like when uh, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron talked about the banana and how it's perfectly designed for the human hand. You can't simply start with where you are and then extrapolate backwards from there. So it helps to start with a primary difference. Science is committed to the process, always revisiting the findings. Apologetics is convinced of its conclusions at the start. So you can't pretend to honestly engage in asking questions if we begin with the assumption of the answers. This will always result in us coming out with twisted conclusions. Admittedly, science has been baffled over the zebra's stripes for a long time. And recently, some studies have shown that the stripes are not actually about camouflaging the herd but from large predators, but are actually about flies. The region where the zebra lives, there are these flies called tsetse flies that are legendary in their viciousness. They actually have tormented uh, foreign armies and actually affected whole wars. Scientists have historically known that these flies have an aversion to landing on striped surfaces, and the zebra stripes pattern acts as their natural deterrent. This leads to a greater health because of less blood loss and therefore a greater vitality which benefits reproduction, passing on those key genetics to its offspring. Turns out that zebra stripes are not actually about camouflaging a herd from large predators, but about individuals deterring small pests. This means that the initial zebra ancestor to have that genetic variation would have benefited and thus the attribute would be more likely to be passed on to the next generation of zebras. So the apologetics argument that I learned was deeply flawed and wouldn't refute the problem that it was intended to. The first problem with not entering in fully to an idea well enough to understand it is that there has to be a commitment to the question, not just a conviction about the conclusion. The second problem is that much of the suspicion from creationists about evolutionary thought is based on the hard and cold version of survival of the fittest from a century ago. Many don't even know of the newer strains of evolutionary thought that incorporate cooperation, mutuality, and emergence thought. You can see more about that in O is for open and relational. Evolution itself has evolved in the last 30 years, but many creation apologists prefer to take pot shots at the straw man caricature of Darwinian schools of the past. They have perfected taking swings at shadows where the theory used to stand. So as we wrap up the ABCs of Modified Theology series, I want to acknowledge that not only has Christian belief evolved and adapted over the centuries, but to encourage you to embrace these historic adjustments. Look, the gospel itself is incarnational, and the universe is evolutionary. These two things go together beautifully. The gospel is good news and it is constantly in need to be contextualized to its new times and new places. The scriptures are inherently translatable and come into every language and culture authoritatively. This is one of the unique aspects of the Christian religion, and you can see this in K is for kenosis earlier in the series. 
So if evolution is true of the universe, Christians should have no need to avoid it or refute it. We can embrace evolutionary thought wholeheartedly. Christians should, after all, be lovers of the truth. Now, if we want to contest certain aspects of the evolutionary theory, we should at least understand its claims thoroughly so that we can do it well. Christians and atheists do this to each other. Protestants and Catholics do it to each other. Islam and the West do it to each other. We would be served by adopting the debate principle where you have to explain your opponent's position well enough that they say, yes, you have understood my view on this before you succeed. You have to satisfy them before you posit your own position. Here's the problem with not doing that is that you just start in the middle. Look, you can't just walk into the way things are, assume the status quo, and then make a case for it. I was camping, camping in a national park with a friend of mine who lived and loved his red state. So we're hiking out and we're enjoying all the scenery and the beauty. Then he tells me how ridiculous it is that environmentalists are uh, trying to protect this and how stupid all of these regulations on industry are. That they were hand handcuffing the innovators who create jobs for people. His evidence was to point to the trees around and say, look at all this amazing space. What are they so worried about? I don't see why we need all these regulations and get so upset at industry. So I pointed out to him that if 100 years ago, somebody had not had the foresight to preserve this land, that the timber industry would have cut down all of this stuff and harvested all of these trees. It would look nothing like it did, and we wouldn't be walking or hiking there. And he had literally never thought of that. You can't start in the middle and then ignore how things came to be, then present it as evidence of how they should always be. I heard a fundamentalist pastor say, in the Old Testament, God was a king, not a queen. Jesus was a man, not a woman. And he picked men, not women, to deny, betray, and doubt, and abandon him. Actually, I added that last part. He didn't say that part. But that would be like walking into a grocery store, seeing a steak wrapped in saran wrap on a styrofoam platter, and beginning to articulate how perfectly the steak was designed for your grill how the saran wrap crumbles in your hand for the ease of disposal in the wastebasket, and how the steak has the same dimensions and thickness from side to side for consistent grilling. Clearly, God has designed the steak to go in your grill for your enjoyment. If we don't take account of the elaborate set of systems that delivered that perfectly proportioned piece of protein onto your plate, will miss much of the beauty in the process and may falsely be under the impression that the way things are is the way that they have always been and thus the way they should always be. So don't start in the middle. We can't get back to the beginning and we shouldn't start with the conclusions already established. What's left for us to do then? Understand our opponent's position, explore the history of our own, and account for the ways that our current position has been adapted and adjusted. This is why we do modified theology. So that's it. That's the end of the series, and I will look forward to our conversation. Comments, questions, concerns, let's talk.